that balancing of having some exploratory learning experiences where you're breaking out of that, doing things cheaper, faster, more reliably, but you're looking at what might be possible or how can we develop and learn and grow as individuals. Welcome back to the Management Theory Toolbox, your top destination for uncovering the why behind the management and business concepts. If you're a business owner, management consultant, executive, business student, or someone simply toying around with the idea of starting a business, and you want to know the behind the scenes management theory rooted in the latest and most robust management research, then you're in the right place. I'm your host, Travis Mallett. And today we're venturing into our very first organizational behavior topic, learning. Let's review our journey so far. We began in episode one by exploring the concept of emergence in nature, which led us to think of organizations as dynamic living systems. We found in episode two that this living system idea is described by a technical term, complex adaptive systems. And what's a complex adaptive system that we're all familiar with? That's right, the human brain. In fact, organizations and businesses mirror many of the features of the neural networks we find in our brains. And we took that analogy a bit too literally in episode seven to uncover the ideas behind high involvement management, a powerful set of management practices that have captured the attention of researchers over the past couple decades. So what's next? Let's continue to use this analogy of organizations as neural networks to fuel our journey What's one of the most important and striking features of the human brain? What's that you say? Consciousness? Well, okay, that's probably the correct answer, but we're not ready to open that can of philosophical worms just yet. So what's the next most important feature of the human brain? That's right, the ability to learn. It's the adaptive part of complex adaptive systems. Aside from consciousness, the ability to learn or the ability for the brain to reorganize itself and its connections to adapt, retain information, and create new mental models is one of the main features we think of that makes us different from machines. Even today, with all the advances in machine learning, the human brain is still far superior at adapting to a variety of scenarios than even the most sophisticated machine learning algorithm. So here's where it gets interesting. In the human brain, we have all these neurons and synapses happening, connections getting stronger, weaker, adapting as we learn and change our behavior. Meanwhile, organizations are also like neural networks. When an organization encounters a business problem, teams often get reorganized, new processes are developed, and people interact with different members of the organization. The result? Organizations themselves can learn and adapt, creating new connections and pathways for information flow in much the same way as our brains. But as has become our refrain on this show, and as we discussed at length in episode eight, everything is more complicated than you think. The people making up an organization are also learning and adapting. Sometimes they're learning from the organization. Other times, the organization is learning from individuals who influence changes within the organization. Both are always happening simultaneously. Sometimes it's hard to know where individual learning begins and organizational learning ends. It's the merging of minds, the dance of individual and organizational learning, which is the title of this episode. Why is this important? Learning both individual and organizational learning is the bedrock of innovation, research and development, and improving operational efficiency. But perhaps even more importantly, learning is a key part of developing and maintaining competitive advantage. And that's why we're going to be spending several episodes unpacking this concept. To help us better understand this issue, we're joined by Dr. Ryan Smerick, who has authored several books on the topics of individual and organizational learning. Hi, Ryan, and welcome to the show. Nice to meet you, Travis. So before we get started, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your background and work. 
Sure. I am Ryan Smerick. I'm an associate professor and associate director at Northwestern University in the Master's in Learning Organizational Change program. And I teach a lot of different topics, learning and development, individual learning and development, organizational learning. I teach a class on cognitive design, that human biases and ways to overcome that. I teach people analytics. And I've published two books, one organizational learning and performance that dives into individual learning and how to build learning culture. And then a recent book called Speaking Up at Work, Leading Change as an Independent Thinker that looks at individual stories of speaking up at work and being a lone voice and what that experience is like and what individuals learn in that process. And then what management psychology literature teaches us about being a dissenter and speaking up. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. So in today's episode, we're exploring the relationship between individual and organizational learning. And in your book, Organizational Learning and Performance, you talk about these three metaphors of learning as an individual. The mind is a computer, the mind is an author, and then also intuitive and reflective minds. Can you walk us through what those three metaphors are and give us an explanation? Sure. In some context for the chapter, Really, the the field of organizational learning had basically one dominant way of looking at it was Chris Argus's work on single loop and double loop learning. And single loop is making small iterations to how you think about a topic. Double loop is deeper underlying assumptions. And it was a very popular way to look at it. But there's a lot of learning scientists. And if you were to talk to a cognitive scientist about single and double loop learning, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. And my intent with the chapter was to synthesize some of the cognitive science of learning and additional fields to ground the science of learning in organizations. So I use those three metaphors to synthesize three different bodies of work. The mind as a computer is typically what we think of when you think about encoding, storing, retrieving information and that kind of gradual accumulation of facts. And especially this is really salient when you're new to an organization. I did a research project of new college presidents that were outsiders to the organization. And one president said it took me about six months before anything made sense because the people would be talking about different names and places and people, and they'd have no idea what they were talking about. And that's the, the mind as a computer synthesizes all that research as you think about your explicit factual information about the world or an organization. The second one, the mind as a developing author, built on a lot of different fields, but one of them is constructive developmental theory, how do we construct meaning? So typically out of some sort of disordering dilemma, something happens that's confusing, surprising, and we have to make sense out of it, interpret it. And so it synthesizes the research in that area, looks at informational versus transformational learning when we have these transformational experiences that shift our way of thinking and in larger qualitative ways. And one example of this is if you get a bad performance review, that's really confusing. It's out of the blue. There's lots of different ways you can interpret that. You can interpret it in a real defensive way. And maybe that would be your automatic move to blame your boss or the organization. And there's other ways you can interpret it, how you can take the feedback and learn from it. Maybe it's transformational, maybe not. It could just be an impactful learning experience. But that whole metaphor is about when you have those disorienting dilemmas, how do you make sense out of them? What does research say about that process? The last one is the intuitive and reflective mind. And this was trying to make sense and articulate that we do pick up all these different, partly unconsciously, but this implicit learning when we're absorbed in activity and an organization, we just want to pick up the norms and ways of being and ways of seeing. And so I talk about two different in the intuitive and reflective minds top-down learning and bottom-up learning. And top-down learning is mostly things that start real explicitly and then they become implicit. There are simple things like learning how to drive that you have to really be consciously thinking about everything. And then over time, it's top-down learning. It becomes an in intuitive reaction. And bottom-up learning is we're absorbing all these implicit messages all the time. And bottom-up learning is trying to reflect on that implicit knowledge and why I think the way I think. One example might be an intuitive reflective mind and a work example, being a skilled presenter. If you're trying to work on your presentation skills, you maybe you have some very explicit rules like, okay, I need to make eye contact with the audience very explicitly. And so you're thinking of it a very top-down learning way. You're, you have all these explicit rules in your mind. The more and more practice you get, 
that becomes intuitive. You know how to respond quickly. At the same time, maybe you have some bottom-up learning of your intuitive expertise. Like, why didn't this presentation go as well as I thought it did? Or I got some feedback here that was surprising. That would be the kind of bottom-up learning of your intuitive expertise. So that area also synthesizes all the literature that talks about you know, how we become very fast automatic. You can think about games like chess and everything where pattern recognition is super fast and automatic. And so that final metaphor synthesizes that field study. Going back to the mind as an author, I'm wondering if there's some overlap with the computer analogy. I think it was Socrates who emphasized discovery of innate knowledge. You can learn the Pythagorean theorem just by thinking about it. No empiricism needed. That's what I'm getting as a sense from the mind as an author. We have this experience, but then it triggers lots of self-reflection and recategorizing previous information that we already have. Yeah, I think there will be overlap here. The one way I distinguish some of that is mind as a computer, emotions are not really central in that process. Whereas the mind as a developing author, at least there's making sense of our emotions is more central in that area. It's also trying to build on the cognitive science as a whole that was studying learning, at least in the 1970s, 80s or so, was a very kind of cool non-emotional process. And that's the field that's building on. And then the mind is developing author, at least usually qualitative scholars that are looking at these big life events where you change how you view the world based on some sort of big emotional experience that you have. So I, I agree there can be a lot of overlap in the, in the metaphors. Also on the, the intuitive mind, can you talk just a little bit about the conscious versus unconscious aspect of that? Sometimes we're consciously observing people. I want to do what John is doing. and I'm going to do it the way he's doing it. But there's also mm -hmm. a lot of times where we just do that subconsciously and don't even realize it. Yeah. I have an image in the book on the intuitive and reflective mind to help because we are absorbing different things, especially like language per se. We don't set out explicitly to learn, but we pick up all these grammatical rules. That's just how it's said. If you're trying to explain it to a foreign international student, it's very hard. It's, it's just the way it is. You know, we pick up all these rules in a more intuitive way on the implicit level. We can reflect on those and make them. I hesitate to use unconscious and conscious. I usually use the system one, system two, Daniel Kahneman language, because unconscious can connote that it's this ineffable Freudian notion that I can't really gain access to, which wouldn't really be true per se. Intuitive would be this sort of automatic reaction. And it sort of builds on the common work and Keith Stanovich work on system one and system two, with the prototypical example being the expertise literature that really looks at, like chess, for example, you have this thousands of hours of practice and it just becomes this automatic reaction, automatic pattern recognition. But at the same time, a lot of it you can turn into explicit language. That makes perfect sense. All right. Now that we have a better understanding of individual learning, how does that relate to organizational learning? And maybe you can talk about how we build a learning culture in an organization. Sure. I think it forms the foundation of creating a learning culture. And in the organizational learning performance book, I talk about five different organizations that I would categorize that have a learning culture. And I think there's lots of different social norms that support that. One of them that's predominant in organizational learning literature is that balance of exploration and exploitation, or you can say learning and execution. But it, as I talk about in the book, I use WD-40 as a story to talk about building a learning culture. And, and Gary Ridge, the CEO there, that really tried to build a, a learning culture, a learning organization. And they were what he called a typhoon zone, meaning they just did the same thing over cheaper, faster, more reliably, and were caught in these real execution-focused mindset, which is very important at certain points of life cycle of any organization, but it's that balancing of having some exploratory learning experiences where you're breaking out of that, doing things cheaper, faster, more reliably, but you're looking at what might be possible or how can we develop and learn and grow as individuals. I try to use that to make the point that it's not just all about exploration, all learning. It's not like organizations should become like graduate school seminars, but there's a balance and tension instead of 100% of our time in these sort of executions making things cheaper, faster, more reliably. We do some exploration that helps us adapt in the future. And 
that was the case for WD-40 because they had the one product. It was in over 90% of households and they were having some existential threats from competitors that were starting to make similar products and they needed to move to this more exploration learning culture to help them envision a new future that would help them survive and grow. So that story is also told among even this exploration exploitation trade-off. People talk about different animals and how they might exploit one food source and not explore other areas and it threatens their ability to adapt long-term. So that's one norm. There's lots of others that I talk about in the book about fostering some kind of transparency and psychological safety on your team to help employees share insights. Psychological safety is a key one that helps de-risk your experience to engage in these kind of more exploratory behaviors, exploratory actions. So as individuals learn, it's clear that the organization of which they comprise also learns. But are there instances where an individual is not strictly speaking learning, but still can or should incite some sort of change and learning in the organization? Yeah, one of the distinctions that I often draw on and, and mention in classes here is the learning in versus learning by an organization. And learning in an organization is what you typically think of. It's, I learned something new, some kind of new skill. When I leave the organization, it goes with me, you know, resides in, within my mind. Learning by an organization would be, say, I implement some kind of new routine process, new structure. And when I leave, that's still the way things are done in the organization. That would be the learning by an organization that you have a new routine, a new structure, new process that stays with the organization. So you also talk about cultivating a capacity for independent thinking. And I'm curious, when should we conform to the structures and processes and beliefs of the organization? And what are some clues for us to know how to pick our battles? Yeah, that's a great question. So this is the Speaking Up at Work book. But as I think about cultivating capacity for independent thinking, I explore the critical thinking, building expertise, following your curiosity, taking a scientific mindset, value and reason and truth. It could be speaking up about maintaining integrity to professional norms as well. So those are almost always a good, but you don't always want to be a naysayer and you could certainly be wrong as well. I interviewed 50 people about their experience speaking up about different issues. Sometimes it might be an automatic reaction. They just think this is a bad move. I didn't really necessarily consciously deliberate that I was going to pick this battle, but it just came up out of nowhere and I needed to say something. Other times I may have a chance to think about whether this is worse speaking up about. And there'd be lots of different things. One of them is perceived sense of advocacy or fertility. It's not going to matter if I say anything. Everybody's already decided. But there can be a certain value expressive worth of at least saying your piece, at least sharing your perspective on whether you think a strategy is a good idea or not. If you're in the deliberation phase, maybe it's 10 people all going for, yes, votes were doing this. In that deliberation phase, it's, it's worth saying, I hesitated for these reasons. I think this might be a bad move. In that moment, it would be a good thing to share that just to induce a conversation about things. But it's obviously when you go into implementation phase, we decide we're doing it. At that point, it doesn't make sense to keep being a naysayer. But it, it could be if you're, say, a whistleblower. I had some examples of whistleblowers in, in the book. And it, that is not really for the good of the organization per se. But it's adhering to this larger set of hyper norms, whether it's human rights or non-fraudulent ethical activity that you're sorry, hearing to this higher level. One example is a, a whistleblower in South Africa. She was asked to illegally transfer funds overseas that she knew was unethical and against the law. As she spoke up about that, she was fired for that and had a difficult time rebuilding her life. But in that case, she wasn't hearing it. Some of it was her personal conscience and what she would tell her own kids if this blew up into a scandal and she was doing these un unethical activities. Some of it was also for the benefit of the South African economy. She knew that offshoring $50 million way beyond the legal limit, it would hurt the larger economy. So there's also that broader concern of whistleblowers. It's not necessarily for the benefit of the organization per se, but adhering to some sort of larger ethical set of norms. That's how I've been thinking about it. You mentioned picking your battles in connection with your values. That makes a lot of sense to me. One of my longtime managers, he was very clear that one of his primary values was the people on his team. It was his number one priority, the thing that he valued the most. 
So I, I did have a few conversations with him about, well, how do you pick your battles on some of these things, especially as I started going into management. And he said, what I've always done is if it's going to negatively affect my people, that is when I speak up. That is when I fight tooth and nail for my people. Mm -hmm. And so what you just said made a lot of sense to me and just connecting it. Oh, that's why he did that. It makes a lot yeah. of sense connecting it with his values. Yeah. And that relates. I, one of the stories I tell in the chapter on cultivating a capacity for independent thinking was a manager who he was in an organization that had a force ranking system. All of his employees were all good to great performers, but a few people because of that force ranking were going to be forced into this lower category and thought that was really unfair. He spoke up at a big meeting. He was, you know, not even on on the, at the table, he was in a back seat, a junior in an organization, but he really wanted to speak up that he thought this policy was unfair uh, for now one of his employees would have a quote, black mark on their record. And he was paternalistically scolded and spoken down to that all organizations do this. Don't you know that? But the organization was a social service organization that would help people in need. And he really thought this is what we're about. And I should be helping one of my employees that are going to be unfairly treated like this. So it was a battle he chose to pick, but he eventually was successful in not having that person rank lowly, but they didn't clearly articulate that we're going to deviate from this policy, but he was able to be successful. You need to have a lot of, in the sort of dissent literature and some of the key studies, having this healthy sense of self-worth that you can do that and take the risk of looking stupid and being spoken down to is, is a challenge. So now on cultivating a capacity for independent learning. I think some listeners might immediately think when they hear that phrase, think of that coworker who is just my way or the highway. I've got to figure it out. I'm going my own direction. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm sure you have a lot more nuance than that. <laughs> and maybe this is leading the question too much. It hinges on that capacity where you're developing your capacity and you're not always mm -hmm. exercising it, but anyway, maybe tell us a little bit, flesh that out. What is this capacity for independent thinking? Sure. I talk about the ash line judgment studies where they have one line that's six inches long and then you've got another card and it says A, B, and C. One of those lines is six inches, the other is like 12 inches, the other is like two inches. It's really obvious which line is. And you're in the experiment and the nine people before you all say that the two inch line is the same length as the six inch line and you're befuddled. And I just don't see it that way. The six inch line is the same as the six inch line. One of the examples I use in the first chapter is a board kind of rushing to approve a $30 million capital campaign. One person thinks, wait a minute, this is a bad idea. We don't have anywhere near the funds for this. It could change the whole mission of our school, raise tuition, et cetera. And she speaks up about that to collage things and get more assurances about how we're going to be able to do this. Being one out of 30 or so to speak up, you really put yourself at the center of the spotlight there, you can be despised. It depends how you do it, but if you do it in a very arrogant kind of scolding way, you'll be more despised, but you can certainly do it in a way that's expressing your values in a way that induces a conversation about some of the risks that you see. But I think you, you could be wrong if you're one out of 30, or you could be right. And in her case, there were other people that shared her concerns, but did not want to speak up because they were afraid of the, the headmaster there. So you're likely to help break that conformity or group think in a way. That reminds me of Chris Argus' work. He has a well-known HBR article, Teaching Smart People How to Learn, where he makes similar point at the individual level, that there's that distortion of reality in a lot of ways, not in a nefarious way, but to not really see reality clearly. And that always came home to me. Chris Argus, I, I read a story about his professional life that he was so dominant in this field of organizational learning. And he had a professional role before he moved into more academic roles. And when he left, they gave him this beautiful party and said how wonderful he was and how much they're going to miss him. And he said he went back a few years later to the organization and they said, oh, we we're so happy you left. We all couldn't stand, we couldn't stand you as a manager or, or management style. He's like, why didn't you ever tell me any, any of this? And you could see that sort of formed a lot of his work that's had a big impact on the field of organizational learning, but can be hard to get good information, good feedback, and which makes it really hard to learn. That's mostly at the individual level and the organizational level that would be true as well. But there's also a, at the organizational level, getting that accurate 
reality feedback about how a product is doing or what are the trends. There's a real survival value of knowing, getting an accurate picture of things. So an accurate picture of the market. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for joining us. And before we sign off, can you tell our listeners how they can find you and your work? Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn, the Northwestern University faculty website, or my website, www.ryansmerick, R-Y-A-N-S-M-E-R-E-K.com. The two books, Organizational Learning and Speaking Up at Work, are, are both on Amazon as well. All right. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, no, happy to have you talk. So just to summarize, learning, both individual and organizational, is the cornerstone of growth and adaptability in today's dynamic business landscape. As individuals, we navigate various metaphors of learning, from the mind as a computer encoding and retrieving information, to the mind as an author crafting meaning from our experiences, balancing intuition and reflection. We absorb implicit knowledge while consciously developing expertise. Within organizations, fostering a learning culture is essential. This involves striking a balance between exploration and exploitation, encouraging transparency and psychological safety, and valuing independent thinking. However, picking our battles wisely, aligning with our values, and knowing when to conform or challenge norms are crucial aspects of cultivating a capacity for independent thinking. Ultimately, whether at the individual or organizational level, learning fuels innovation, resilience, and success. It's not just about accumulating knowledge, but about continuously evolving, adapting, and pushing boundaries. This week, maybe take some time to examine these different levels and types of learning in your team and workplace. Are there some processes that are stuck in old ways of doing things that need to adapt or learn from the business environment? Are you creating a two-way learning channel between the organization and your employees? Are they receiving training useful for their jobs and for integration into the larger organization? Have you developed enough psychological safety for employees to speak up at work and thus teach the organization a thing or two? As usual, we don't have the answers to these questions in this podcast. They are unique to you and your situation. And it's your responsibility to take this management theory and grapple with it in your individual context. So together, let's embrace the dance of learning, both within ourselves and our organizations, and watch as it propels us forward towards greater heights of achievement and fulfillment. So with that, thank you for tuning in to the Management Theory Toolbox, your top destination for the behind the scenes of management and business theory. In our next episode, we're going to continue our exploration of individual and organizational learning in part two. In the meantime, keep learning, keep growing, and keep building your management theory toolbox.